Story number one. I'll tell you how lucky I am. This true story took place in San Diego, California. I was still young and stupid. But what happened, I'll remember for the rest of my life. I haven't spoken to my ex-wife for a long time, unlike my ex-mother-in-law. She doesn't forget my phone number, and sometimes she'll call me. We start the conversation with news, what's going on in someone's life, and end with one. Maybe we'll meet. I always like to meet her. She's a gorgeous woman, not like an old woman at all. She's a little over 50. She's got a great figure and a great face. We make an appointment. I get ready, take a bath, put on fresh underwear. Most of the time, we communicate on neutral territory in a hotel, for example. We choose the farthest one so we won't meet anyone. My mother-in-law arrives first, prepares the room for my arrival, and finally we meet. We pounce on each other. We miss each other. She does things in bed that words can't describe. We barely come to our senses. I had a fling with my ex-mother-in-law after my divorce from my first wife. It was an accident. We crossed paths, drank wine, and woke up in someone else's bed. I see my mother-in-law sleeping under the blanket. I was surprised, but I didn't panic. Since then, we meet not often, but at will. But that's not all. I got married for the second time. I got a second mother-in-law. And here's the interesting thing. I had an affair with her too. She's a gorgeous, not old yet juicy aunt. It's just the way things are. I didn't do anything for it myself. It's not my fault that old women jump on me. Of course, I answer them with great pleasure. That's how it happened in my life that I am simultaneously with my former and present mother-in-law. The main thing is not to confuse them by name. The only problem is finding the time. The former mother-in-law is blonde, a little gaunt, but she's okay. The current brunette is lush, slender legs. The wife, of course, knows nothing about it. For her, this knowledge is unnecessary. I came home one day. My wife met me with a disgruntled face. She says someone called you, some girl. I fake-eyed. What kind of girl? My wife says she's my ex-mother-in-law. What does she want from you? The wife asks with indignation. I answer, and how do I know? Maybe she wants to give me some things. I left a lot of things to my ex-wife. My wife calmed down and stopped interrogating me. I exhaled and slapped myself on the forehead. What a fool. I forgot my cell phone at home. It's good that my wife didn't get into the correspondence. She would have been surprised. She had something to be surprised about. There are spicy messages from her mom. I took the phone, closed myself in the toilet, erased the history of correspondence, and blocked it just in case. You never know. I just relaxed. I get another call. And it's my current mother-in-law. Those aunts... They don't give me any peace at all. They've tortured the man to death. I'm back in the bathroom so no one can talk. What do you want? Mother-in-law asked in a whisper. I want to meet. She answered playfully. When? I clarified the time of the meeting. Tomorrow, she said. All right, tomorrow's tomorrow. Tomorrow came. I began to prepare for the meeting. I just got myself an order, and then I got a call. It's my ex-mother-in-law, the blonde. We talked, and it turned out that she wouldn't mind having fun with me. And on this day, too. I began to crumple, postponing the meeting, lied that at work overall. Mother-in-law took offense, pouted her lips, began to persuade me to excuse myself from work, and asked so insistently that I realized that I could not postpone the meeting too much she wants affection and warmth. I started to think what to do. I decided to kill two kangaroos with one shot. Appointed a meeting in the same hotel, but on different floors and at different times, booked two rooms, payment by the hour. I got in the car and drove off. While I was driving, I was mentally calculating the time. I decided to give each of them an hour and a half. It's okay, we'll manage. I arrived at the hotel, went up to the room, and then my ex-mother-in-law showed up. 
I got through with her quickly, ordered dinner in the room, we ate and said goodbye. I kept looking at my watch. My mother-in-law left the hotel first, watching from the window as she walked down the street. I exhaled. I've managed with one. I left the room, headed for another. Prepaid and on a different floor. A few minutes go by, knock on the door. I open the door, and there's my ex-mother-in-law. And there we go again. I wasn't very passionate. After all, I had time to shoot not so long ago. But it's all right, I got through her too. She didn't want to leave for a long time. She asked for more. But I hinted not to be impudent. I still have to go to my wife. My mother-in-law said it was reasonable. We drank wine, hugged. My mother-in-law went back to her place. I could barely crawl to the car. My legs wouldn't hold me. A double load is no joke. My wife met me at home, asking why I was so tired. I lied about a difficult business trip. They say the client was capricious, all the nerves I wore out. My wife looked at me in disbelief, as if studying me. But then she waved her hand. She has plenty of things to do without me. I decided not to meet two mothers-in-law on the same day. It's costly financially, and it takes a lot of energy. That's how we live, keeping a schedule so we don't get confused. Of course, I could easily say goodbye to one of them. But I'm hooked. They know there's no stallion better in bed than me. Both of them are experienced. They're not embarrassed. They don't waste time. I've had young girls before. I don't want to do it with them again. They don't know what they're doing and why they're doing it. And they're a lot of trouble to deal with. If you hesitate, your wife will find out. I like my ex-mother-in-law better. I won't hide it. She has some features that make me like her body. She can make any acrobat do that. The current mother-in-law is calmer, but she has her charms too. I'm not ready to give them up. I'm used to pleasing myself, but also her at the same time. I tell my friends, they can't believe I'm so well settled. It turns out that in addition to my wife, I have two mistresses, and there are permanent and no problems with them. Well, you're crazy, my friends tell me. I'm sure they're secretly jealous. I'm very lucky. That's how I live, keeping a clear plan in my head so as not to mix up the order. I don't want to leave anyone out. I met with my ex-mother-in-law and checked the box, so I have to take care of the real one. I'm figuring out how we're going to do this. I send a text message to her phone. Of course she's happy. She runs to waxing, tries on new clothes, looks in the mirror. I like Lacey transparent dark colors. It's a real turn on. After a message or a call, I immediately erase the dirt. I became careful. My wife more and more often stops on me, an attentive look, as if studying. In short, I have nothing to complain about in this life. My mother-in-law, former and present, can't complain either. I work with them qualitatively. I give all my strength in bed. I know what each of them loves, but I can say that I fulfill all their wishes. That's why I don't want to say goodbye to them. For five years, I will definitely be enough. And then we'll see. They are still blooming women, despite their age. They have a lot of strength. They'll be enough for me. This is the adventure of my life. I have to tear myself apart, share myself, so to speak. This risky balancing act with my former and current mother-in-law has been going on for several years. I've honed my juggling skills by carefully planning my adventures and not letting my wife know my secret. I know it's only a matter of time before this house of cards collapses. I've had instances where dates overlapped or my wife almost discovered dangerous messages from her mom. But the high of duplicity fuels my addiction to these mature women. Just last month, the unthinkable happened to my ex and current mother-in-law found out about each other. I still don't know how they discovered my double life, but one day I received WhatsApp messages demanding me to meet them at a cafe. When I walked into the cafe, my adrenaline was running high and both women were sitting with stern expressions on their faces. I sat down in a chair and laughed nervously. Before I could speak, 
my ex handed me a picture across the table. It showed me kissing my not-ex mother-in-law passionately in front of my car after a lustful encounter. Is there anything you want to tell us, Casanova? My ex growled. My current mother-in-law glared dangerously at me. Trapped, I stammered my pathetic confessions of inability to confront them. The women looked at each other. I braced myself for their fury. What happened next shocked me more than their confrontation. They smiled slyly at each other. Then they smiled seductively at me. We're upset that you lied, my now mother-in-law said, stroking my hand. We could have split you up. And the three of us got down to business, my former mother-in-law said. So, no catfight then? Asked it weakly. They laughed out loud. Oh, we'll fight but for your attention. Exchanging a knowing look, they escorted me out of the cafe, never to be forgotten. I may be lecherous, but even I couldn't imagine having both mother-in-laws at once. This new arrangement is a dream I don't deserve. At home, my wife seems to suspect that something has changed. My swagger and vigor have increased tenfold. When she asks why I'm so chipper, I just kiss her on the cheek and promise to arrange a special date night. But I need to conserve my energy for the moment when a duo of insatiable cougars come calling. Story number two. Michael, shame on you. What time do you get off work? Five o'clock. What time is it now? 10. Deborah's gonna come and find out you're flirting with girls, and she's gonna divorce you. Don't you know her? Or you can't bear to wait another week. Arrived yesterday, Maria, my favorite mother-in-law, reprimanded me in the kitchen at the table when I, e, a little late after work, a little drunk, came home. My wife, Deborah, had been in a sanatorium for two weeks, and at her request, my mother-in-law had come to our house for a couple of days to tidy up the household, which had really been neglected without a woman's hand. I opened the kitchen cupboard and took out a bottle of whiskey. It goes on, but get something to eat, Michael. Well, if you, Maria, can help with that, I guess I'll be home and on time. The mother-in-law, at once, not understanding the meaning of what she had heard, continued calmly cutting bread. But when, at last, she realized what the drunken son-in-law had said. She suddenly froze with a knife in her hand, and pink spots ran down her face. Michael, you didn't say anything, and I didn't hear anything. For some reason, she switched to a whisper and tried not to look me in the eyes. And with this, she obviously had problems, because a woman of her age will not just blush like a girl at the mere mention, and the father-in-law obviously did not cope with his duties at all. Well, the usual story. I drank some more whiskey, took a cold sandwich, and got up from the table. I'm going to go to bed, I guess. In our one-room apartment, in addition to the bed, there was a sofa, so the bed for a while was given to my mother-in-law, and I had to sleep on it opposite. Covering my eyes, I lay there and listened to my mother-in-law rattling a bucket in the bathroom, filling it with water, and then making noise with a rag in the kitchen on the floor. After a while, everything quieted down, and soon she came into the room with a bucket in her hand to wash here as well. She looked at me with a kind of belittling look in which you could read. What are you doing? So, anyway, I couldn't take it. Woke up around 7-7 in the morning and started to quickly get ready for work. Then all day, until 5 o'clock, I was worried and thought about how I would come home and what my mother-in-law and I would say to each other. But when I came back from work, I didn't find her in the apartment. On the stove was still hot pot of my favorite soup, and on the table, a large covered with a towel plate of pies. A week later, my wife returned from vacation, refreshed, and life went on week after week. Once after a couple of months, my wife Deborah went to visit her parents for the weekend, and when she returned on Sunday evening, she had no time to put her bag down and shouted at me from the doorstep. Do you know what my mother has done? Instead of grandchildren, she decided to babysit her kid, and she's pregnant. I froze in shock as the positive pregnancy test flopped to the floor. My mother-in-law Maria is pregnant at her age. 
This had to be some kind of freak mistake. Deborah burst into tears, inconsolable. Between sobs, she explained that her mother had confessed to everything. Apparently, during that drunken night a few weeks ago, the same thing had happened between Maria and me. The next morning, we both agreed it had been a huge mistake and vowed never to bring it up again. But now, the consequences were undeniable. Maria was carrying my child, while my wife was left infertile after suffering an infection years ago. Deborah felt doubly betrayed, not only by her husband's betrayal, but also by her own mother's betrayal. Our already strained marriage was now shattered beyond repair. In the agonizing days that followed, I tried desperately to reconcile with Deborah. I recognized the awfulness of my actions. In a moment of weakness, I had destroyed everything we had built together. But we could have gotten through this, even raised Maria's child as our own, if only Deborah had given me another chance. But Deborah was adamant. Divorce was the only way out. She could never forgive me or her mother. The grief and anger were too deep. Maria moved in with distant relatives, and her growing belly was a source of unbearable pain for Deborah. And so our once happy home turned into endless litigation over belongings and money. Saddened by the loss of Deborah, I began drinking heavily again, which jeopardized my safety at work. I knew I deserved all this suffering after the choices I had made. But that realization didn't lessen the suffering as my life unraveled thread by thread. Almost a year later, when I was laid off from my job and on the brink of poverty, I had an unexpected visitor, Maria. She had given birth to a healthy baby boy named Michael Jr. and had come back to try to fix things before moving overseas to raise him alone. Seeing my son for the first time was both joyful and painful. He had my eyes and smirk, but Maria had my brown hair and graceful facial features. Emotions swirled in my head, love, pride, shame, regret, excitement for my new life mixed with sorrow for the destruction I'd caused. I vowed to sober up and rebuild my life to be there for this child, my only family. Mariah apologized for her role in the affair. She was lonely and vulnerable that night, but she realized what she had done was inexcusably wrong. Yet despite all the pain, she couldn't fully repent for what she had done. Our son was the light of her life. She wished that Deborah would one day find the strength to forgive us before she died. I hoped so too, but I understood her bitterness. I made my bed and now had to lie in it alone. Over the next decade, I slowly rebuilt my life around my son, Michael Jr., who came to visit me on summer vacation. Sobriety allowed me to advance my career and eventually become a respected accountant. I never remarried, but found comfort in my family role, choosing to be the stable, ethical father my boy deserved. We developed a deep love connection even across the miles. Seeing Michael Jr. grow and thrive was a balm that soothed my lingering guilt over the past. In him, I saw the man I hoped to be compassionate, responsible, and deeply committed to his family. Maria did a remarkable job raising him to be humble and kind. When Michael Jr. was 15 years old, Maria passed away after a brief battle with breast cancer. This loss devastated both of us. At the funeral, I was shocked to come face to face with a grieving, aging Deborah after nearly 20 years of separation. She had reconciled with Mary before her death, but still kept her distance from me. I wondered if she secretly resented the fact that I was still involved in raising her mother's child. In the months that followed, Michael Jr. and I supported each other through the pain of his mother's absence. In my new role as a single parent, our bond grew even deeper. We both pledged to honor Maria's memory through our actions. I sought to redeem myself by helping Michael Jr. become a good person. On my son's wedding day, five years later, I glowed with pride in the man he had become kind, ethical, and devoted to his pregnant wife. As we danced together laughing, I noticed Deborah watching longingly from afar. In Michael Jr., she saw the man I had become, the father she had once hoped I would become. Catching my gaze, Deborah nodded politely, a hint of a smile on her lips. 
After all these years, I had finally earned redemption in her eyes. My greatest mistakes had produced my greatest joy, this caring young man embracing his radiant bride. Not all was forgiven, but in this moment it was enough. Story number three. Support the channel by liking, subscribing, writing comments. Summer in California is beautiful. Country house, working on the homestead. And I didn't love it all, with all my heart. Standing in an interesting pose and weeding overgrown for a week beds. As if I hadn't done the same thing five days ago. Everything is overgrown. Everywhere you look, just weeds. Stephanie, my beautiful and enterprising wife, had a day off work and hung up because she had too many projects and now she couldn't finish any of them. And me, poor and unhappy lazy, threw me on the fragile shoulders of her mother. Pamela, my mother-in-law, has always been a beautiful woman. I saw her photos of the times of 20 or 25 years, but now she has become the one who is looked at by both simple laborers and businessmen. Admittedly, I myself sometimes let my eyes catch on her lush form. It was as if my wife did not go to her mother, though who knows how it will be. I straightened up with a creak of my loins and looked at the front of the work. I wanted to do something else, but I only sighed sadly. My mother-in-law will not let me go to the men to drink beer until the vegetable garden is clean and beautiful. That's what she told me when we first got here this morning. What's up, son-in-law? came the voice of my sweet mother-in-law behind me. I turned around. She stood on the threshold of the house in her usual sports pants and sneakers. But the t-shirt was something different. Noticing my glance, my mother-in-law laughed and waved her hand. My t-shirts are drying. I took my daughter's t-shirt. And everything would be all right. It's just business as usual. But the inscription on the t-shirt was telling kiss me if you like rock. Grinning, I tossed the instrument aside and headed toward Pamela's. She stared back in surprise. What are you doing? I like rock. Once I was next to her, I put my arms around Pamela's neck and kissed her right on the lips. My mother-in-law was stunned for a few seconds. Then she resisted a little, but finally she responded. She let me get my fingers under her lucky t-shirt and didn't even argue when I pushed her into the cabin. What are we doing, son-in-law? she asked in an unsteady voice. Heavy breathing and a wandering look at my face gave her away. I'm not the only one who's been in love, Rock. Nothing wrong with that, I replied, pulling off my t-shirt in one swift motion. Just a little break from work. You don't mind, do you? I smiled slyly and stepped close to her again. Pamela looked away embarrassed, then nodded. Yes, I don't mind and I'm only glad. That's an excuse to postpone work for later. Pamela and I got carried away, our secret passions spilling out. In the aftertaste, we were overcome with guilt. It was my wife's mother. What was I thinking? We dressed quickly, without meeting glances. This shouldn't have happened, I muttered. You're right. It was a mistake, Pamela sighed. But what a good thing it was nonetheless, she added quietly. We agreed to never mention our date and awkwardly went back to work. I dove headfirst into renovations so I wouldn't be alone with Pamela. Over the next few weeks, we returned to our usual routine, maintaining a strictly friendly relationship. By the next summer, things were pretty much the same as if nothing had ever happened. Or so it seemed to me. One hot July afternoon, I ran into Pamela at the farmer's market in town. She looked dazzling in her sundress, her hair fluttering in the wind. She was very sexy. My pulse quickened, and drool flowed at the sight of her. Nice to meet you, sweetie, here, she said with a playful smile. We struck up a light conversation about vegetable stalls. As we talked, Pamela gently crossed her fingers over mine. That simple touch sent electricity running through my body. I suggested we take a walk by the lake to catch up. We strolled side by side, chatting lightly, but there was a loving tension in the air. I noticed a secluded bench nestled among the willows. When we sat down, Pamela turned to me, 
her eyes dark and full of longing. I can't stop thinking about last summer, she confessed in a whisper. Me neither, I sighed, my voice trailing off. Without further ado, her mouth found mine. The kisses were hungry, fueled by months of repressed desire. I ran my hands over her body, familiar but somehow newly illuminated by the sunlight. Right or wrong didn't matter in that moment. We had to finish what we'd started. Story number four. Hi, I'm glad to see you on my channel. Show your support by liking and subscribing. Today was not a good day for me. I was late for work, accidentally spilled coffee on a coworker, and collided with a car on the corner near my daughter's house. To make matters worse, I was driving my husband's favorite car. He's going to kill me for sure. I'm very worried about how he's going to react to this situation. In a state of panic, to the screams of the car owner, I tried calling one number, but all were either busy or disconnected. My greatest fear was calling my husband. Finally, my brother-in-law Matthew was the last person on my list who could help. With trembling fingers and tears in my eyes, I dialed his number, feeling incredibly anxious. And that man kept yelling. Hello, Ashley. As a saving melody sounded in the phone, the voice of my son-in-law. Matthew, I had an accident. From my endless slips and sighs, could hardly make out the words. I'm outside your house. I'm on my way. Judging by the noise in the receiver, it was clear that Matthew was really packing up fast. The door slammed shut, followed by a beep. In tears, I kept trying to calm the other driver, but he just kept yelling. Matthew swooped in from the side of the yards. He was the only one who was able to shut up the other driver who was yelling at me. While my son-in-law was deciding what to do now, I stepped aside trying to calm down and stop crying. Matthew walked over to me and held out a bunch of keys. Go home. I'll be there when everything is solved. I nodded gratefully, took the keys, and went to the house of my daughter and son-in-law. Only there I was able to calm down, wash my face, and change into my daughter's home clothes. As I was pouring tea, the front door slammed again. A moment later, Matthew appeared in the kitchen. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. I was still clucking loudly, tightening my trembling fingers. My condition was improving, but it was far from ideal. My son-in-law, noticing my worries, took my hands and led me into the living room, sitting me down on the couch. He sat down next to me and hugged me tightly by the shoulders. Don't cry because of this idiot. It was his own fault that he jumped out of the courtyards. My son-in-law was still saying something in his soothing voice. And I cry again, then calm down and put my head on his chest, cover my eyes. And it's so peaceful to be with him all of a sudden. My husband will kill me, I suddenly voiced my fear. The car was still my husband's, and he valued it very much, and here it is. And again tears spurted from my eyes. No way. My son-in-law started stroking my back again. He won't do anything. I'll explain everything to him. I'm a fool. I'm not stupid. My temple suddenly touched his lips, but I didn't pay any attention to it. It was just another attempt to calm me down. You are a beautiful, intelligent, and wonderful woman. He kept talking as his hands stroked me and his lips kissed me. On my cheek, on my nose, touching my earlobe, the corner of my lips. Matthew, what are you doing? I didn't resist much. He had a calming effect on me. It's nothing. Matthew pulled me closer and sat me on his lap, just trying to help you relax. And I let him do it. When Matthew held me on his lap, I knew I had to end it. But his gentle touch soothed my frayed nerves in a way I hadn't felt in years. I snuggled against him, placing my hands on his chest. It feels good, I admitted quietly. But I probably shouldn't. Shh, Matthew murmured, tilting my chin up to meet his gaze. Let me take care of you. Before I could object, his mouth covered mine in a kiss that melted my resistance. 
How long had it been since I'd been kissed with such passion and tenderness? My body came alive under his skillful hands in a way it hadn't in decades. In my female mind, I knew this betrayal would devastate my daughter if she ever found out about it. But in that moment, as Matthew worshipped my body so thoroughly, I pushed the guilt to the back of my mind. I deserved to feel loved again. We did it right there on my daughter's couch, and the outside world disappeared. I cried out his name as the pleasure overwhelmed me, and his strong frame sheltered me from all harm. Afterward, securely wrapped in Matthew's arms, I confessed that I'd felt attracted to him since I'd first met him years ago, and he shared that he'd always seen me as more than just a mother-in-law. All of this had been going on for longer than either of us wanted to admit. What happens now? I asked, drawing cold circles on his bare chest. Matthew smiled at me with a mischievous glint in his eyes. This is just the beginning for us. From that moment on, Matthew and I met in secret, our shared secret electrifying our every encounter. The risk of exposure only heightened our thirst for adventure and our family remained unaware of the passion burning behind their backs. Story number five. I have been married to my wife, Rebecca, for six years now. In that time, I have realized that she has exceptional hosting skills and can cook delicious meals. Our relationship with her parents is also quite satisfactory, especially my mother-in-law. Even during our wedding, when I had the chance to dance with her, I couldn't help but notice her amazing beauty and impeccable grooming. It felt like I had known her for a long time and felt completely at ease in her presence. I have recently found myself unemployed and have started looking for a job, but have yet to find a suitable one. This situation causes me some discomfort as my wife continues to work and I remain unemployed. When my wife came home from work one evening, I couldn't help but notice her cheerful mood. With curiosity, I asked her if she had gotten her bonus. To my surprise, she replied that she had not. Instead, her good mood was due to the fact that her parents were to visit her the next day. I expressed my admiration by saying, that's fantastic. It will allow us to have something refreshing to drink when they come to visit. My wife offered me a drink and retired to her room. The next morning I woke up early as I couldn't sleep. I made myself a cup of coffee in the kitchen and went out to the balcony to smoke. After a while, I noticed my father-in-law's car pulling up to our driveway. My wife and I went outside to greet them and then gathered in the living room to celebrate their arrival. They didn't plan to return until the next day. My mother-in-law and wife drank wine while my father-in-law and I drank vodka. Within a few hours, everyone was already in high spirits. We joked, laughed, it was good and only in the evening, everyone went to their rooms. I went to my wife, turned on the TV, and started watching it. My wife watched a little with me, then fell asleep, and I didn't sleep. I looked at the clock. It was almost 11 o'clock in the evening. I was thirsty. I went to the kitchen, poured mineral water into a glass, and sat down at the table. Footsteps were heard in the hallway, and my mother-in-law appeared in the doorway. What, Michael? Is thirst drying you up too? She asked. Yes, I answered. Mother-in-law walked to the refrigerator and took a mineral water. My gaze fell on her short robe, which emphasized her figure. The mother-in-law turned around and saw me looking and asked me a question. Well, how do I look? Well, I can see where you're looking. My mother-in-law continued. I had nowhere to go, so I said, okay. Then, to my surprise, my mother-in-law came closer and said, Everyone's asleep, and sat down next to me. It was like I was scalded with boiling water. I had an inkling that something was about to happen. Her face was curious. I was frantically thinking how I should behave and what I should say to make everything come out all right. But my mother-in-law realized I couldn't make up my mind. She moved even closer. And that's when it all started. I only had one thought, not to wake up my wife and father-in-law. As my mother-in-law leaned closer, my breathing quickened. I realized I had to pull away. 
This was wrong on so many levels. She was married to my father-in-law, the mother of my beloved wife, who slept just a few feet away from me, but the intoxicating scent of her perfume beckoned me. When her soft hand lay on my thigh, I shuddered with suppressed desire. How long had it been since I had wanted something so badly? We don't have to, I half whispered, watching her fingers slowly travel up my leg. Then tell me to stop, she threw in, her full lips curving into an understanding smile. We froze for a moment, breathless with tension. Then I pressed greedily against her mouth, no longer caring about vows or sins. She needed this as much as I did. We moved together under the fluorescent lights, the table being my anchor against her passionate onslaught. Any lingering guilt only intensified the pleasure singing through my veins. It was over quickly, and in the silence that ensued, we gasped with anticipation. Fixing our wrinkled clothes, we exchanged sorrowful glances of complete understanding. It could not happen again, but the temptation would continue to haunt us both. I went back to bed with my sleeping wife, and the memory of the secret meeting played again in my mind. Her mother's touch had awakened something dark and predatory in me. It was exactly what I'd missed in her daughter. I hoped what happened in the kitchen would remain a secret behind seven locks. But man, that was so fucking awesome. Story number six. You may judge me when you hear this story to the end, but what happened with my mother-in-law literally saved and revitalized me, giving me back my zest for life. If you are not ready for this turn of events, then stop listening immediately because there will be too many heated revelations next. That afternoon I stayed late again. The client got up from the couch so that I explored everything I hadn't already had time to explore, but such open appeal in women repulsed me. She'd been coming to my massage sessions for two months now and had been trying to hit on me in every way possible, and I pretended not to notice. At home, I was literally sniffed out by my wife. She was looking for nail marks on my back and hickeys in hidden places. In her imagination, I was doing it with all my clients ten times a day. It's worth noting that my wife and I haven't had physical intimacy in a long time. On the basis of constant quarrels and scandals did not become an intimacy of the soul. I did not want to divorce her, and I did not want to cheat on her with some stray girl because before we were happy, and I still hoped that our rifts themselves will be resolved and we will become kin to each other. Our marriage was going down the drain. I reluctantly came home, took overtime jobs, just to stay out longer. This is such a paradox. With my wife, I was bad, but I did not want to leave her. I will understand only someone who is in my place and someone who has never been in a dead-end relationship and cannot imagine how endless feeling of hopelessness in the soul. So that evening, my wife dressed up in a size size less nighty and smeared some cream on her face so generously that I began to worry that she would slip off the bed at night. She laid down next to me and decided to talk. Mason, my mom wants to get a back massage, and I thought I'd let her come to you. You're a good specialist. She trusts you. Sure, no problem. Let her go. When does she want to start? Tomorrow would be good. Okay, have her come in at seven. Zero, I'll have my last client out by then. Okay, I'll tell her. Thank you. Olga turned away from me without kissing me goodnight, as it always happened in the first years of our married life, and soon fell asleep. The next day was again a succession of backs, arms, necks, and fifths of my clients and female clients. By evening, my own arms and legs were humming from the constant exertion, but I still had two more clients, the one who liked to frame and my mother-in-law. The first came today in leopard lingerie. She was lying on the couch with her legs spread, but I stubbornly ignored her hints. I stretched and warmed her back, and she relaxed, but soon the session came to an end. The client sat up so that the straps were falling off her shoulders and looked at me appealingly. If only I were a little less resistant. But then the door to my office swung open, and in she walked. My mother-in-law was a petite, attractive woman with large green eyes. 
Today, she had taken her golden brown hair into a high hairstyle, exposing her white neck with a cute mole just above her collarbones. My mother-in-law looked around the office, lingered on my client, and something predatory flashed in her usually calm eyes. Hello, Mason. The mother-in-law stepped forward and, pretending not to notice the client's bag standing on the floor, kicked it heartily with her Swede boot. Oh, I'm sorry, please. I didn't do it on purpose, Tatiana said. You should be more careful, the seductress replied. Her plans were clearly interfered with. And as for me, I was even glad of the arrival of my mother-in-law, who saved me from additional communication with a possessed woman. Under my mother-in-law's watchful gaze, the leopard-clad beauty got dressed and left the office. Wipe the place clean after her, my mother-in-law said dismissively. I grinned and changed the sheet on the couch. Tell me what's wrong with your back. You know, it's like there are some clamps in my lower back and up here. My mother-in-law pointed to the area of my back between my shoulder blades. Well, we're going to remove your clamps. Take everything off and lie down on the couch, I said, and then I softly turned on some relaxing music and turned on the aroma lamp. In the meantime, my mother-in-law took off her Angora sweater and remained in her red lace top. I had not expected her to wear such a thing, but I was pleasantly surprised. My mother-in-law took the top off and placed it on the chair next to the couch before lying on her stomach and purring blissfully. All day on my feet, finally lying down. She said, I pulled out my best cream, which I used only on exceptional occasions, and walked over to the couch where my wife's mom was seated. Rubbing my hands together, I touched her skin, and she flinched as if she'd been electrocuted. Are you okay? I asked. Yeah, it's just been a while since anyone touched me. I smirked, imagining what would have happened if she had been given, for example, a breast massage. Tatiana's husband disappeared five years ago. One day, he just didn't come home from work. We searched for him with the whole family, together with the police and volunteers, but there were no results. One night, Tatiana received a phone call from someone. At first, the someone breathed heavily into the receiver and then said one single word, sorry. My mother-in-law thinks that her husband just ran away from her and did not have the courage to say goodbye properly. After that, she was all alone. I didn't understand why. She looked younger than her years. She had a beautiful figure, a thin waist, a size four bust, on which men were always staring at her wherever she appeared, a firm and neat fifth point on which the eyes also stopped. Now she was lying with that very point up, and I confess, I stared at her all the time. Her skin was as soft as satin sheets and it felt good to massage it. Tatiana relaxed already two minutes after I touched her for the first time. Mason, you have golden hands, she said. Yes, I even have such an award. I won it in a professional skills contest, I replied, nodding at the statuette on the shelf. You must have a lot of clients. I'm not complaining. They pass it on to each other somehow, so I'm not out of work, I said. Do you give your wife a massage? I did once a long time ago. Not anymore, I said. Why is that? She refuses. She says that after all these, as she puts it, girls of easy behavior, I should not touch her. My mother-in-law laughed. But she doesn't know why she refuses. I'd go to such sessions every day, not just once. Here you just a few minutes massage, and I'm so relaxed as if I slept through the night. For today, our session is over. My mother-in-law got up from the couch without turning to me, but I had time to see her upward sway. She dressed leisurely as if not wanting to leave my office, which she said later in direct text while I was driving her home in the car. It's so nice at your place. It's so relaxing. It's like being at a spa. Come back tomorrow at the same time. Olga was waiting for me at home. Today she was calmer than usual for some reason. How was the session? Your mom has several problem points. We'll try to work through them all, I said. You are my gold, my wife said and kissed me unexpectedly on the cheek.
The next evening, I was waiting for my mother-in-law for some reason. Yesterday's session, i.e., as well as she, liked it. It was pleasant to be in her company. It was easy to be with her. Some light aura emanated from her. She was once again a seductress in front of her. Today she requested a massage of the inside of my thighs, probably hoping I wouldn't hold back. And I have to admit, I was on edge. As the client left the office, I heard someone talking to her. I moved closer to the door and recognized my mother-in-law's voice. Don't come here again, or I'll pull your hair out, she said. How dare you, how dare I? And here we go. The door was ajar, and I saw my mother-in-law clutching at the seductress's hair. She shrieked and tried to fight back, but she failed. The client corrected herself, and I thought I would never see her again. The mother-in-law, a little out of breath and flushed, came and the client retreated, and I thought I would never see her again. My mother-in-law, a little out of breath and flushed, entered the office, said hello, and tried to tell from my eyes whether I had seen what was happening in the hallway. I gave her a completely nonchalant look, and she sighed in relief. I tried to remember the last time a woman had fought over me, and couldn't. It was probably the first such incident in my life. My mother-in-law took off her lemon-colored blouse and folded it on the chair, leaving me in my silk-black underwear. Would you please turn on the music like you did yesterday? She asked. I turned on a CD and lit some incense. My mother-in-law lay on the couch in anticipation. I rubbed cream on my hands, applied it to her body, and touched her. I could tell from her reaction that she wanted it. It felt good to touch her delicate thin neck, her graceful shoulders, to run my fingertips along her shoulder blades and press and demandingly massage her sides. Massage is the most sensual part, and both my mother-in-law and I were attuned to each other today. Suddenly, my mother-in-law let out a barely audible long sigh. Are you feeling ill? I asked excitedly. I'm fine, my mother-in-law said and rolled over on the couch. I stared at her top and she smiled. Your massage is torture for me because you are such a handsome, virile man with gentle and strong hands. She said, I was no longer able to hold back and sank my lips into her mole, on her neck. After that, what my wife suspected me of every day happened several times on the couch. Well, her accusations would not be empty today. My mother-in-law and I got the maximum possible pleasure from this session. After everything, I took her home and made an appointment for the next evening at six. She had deprived me of one client and she would have to make up for it. In the evening, when we were already lying down with my wife, she told me that her mom was very pleased with the session, and then suddenly she timidly asked me to give her a massage. I didn't refuse, even though I was tired from the day and things seemed to be starting to warm up between my wife and me. I don't know what will happen next, but I stopped feeling indifferent to what was happening, and my life began to color again. My affair with Tatiana continued for several more exciting weeks. Our secret trysts were passionate and intense. She brought out a side of me. I didn't even know existed adventurous, uninhibited, insatiable. I was counting the minutes until the next session. Things got better at home too, as Olga and I rekindled our emotional and physical connection. We had some of the best conversations in our marriage. We made love with a tenderness I thought was lost forever. There were times when I forgot anything was wrong at all. I did my best to shut it all out to be fully present in every relationship. But late at night, as I lay awake, filled with endorphins and the ecstasy of our dates with Tatiana, doubts crept in. I realized that I could no longer cheat on two women who had become very dear to me. So one cool fall evening, after Tatiana came out of my office, flushed and radiant, I asked Olga to take a walk with me in the park across the street. The sun was setting, casting everything in a reddish golden light. We sat down on a bench by the pond, the leaves rustling around us. I took a deep breath and told Olga the whole truth about Tatiana and me, about how our emotional romance had grown into a physical one, how being with her had awakened a vitality and passion in me 
that I feared had disappeared. About how some days I felt like Tatiana and Massage were all that kept me going. Naturally, Olga erupted, her face a kaleidoscope of anger, betrayal, devastation. I braced myself for her to get up and leave, to kick me out of the house. But after the first outburst, she just sat there, staring at the darkening water. When Olga finally spoke again, her voice was calm and steady. She said it wasn't my fault that the intimacy and joy in our marriage had disappeared. My betrayal, as painful as it was, had given us the opportunity to repair our relationship or end it for good. In the thickening twilight, we talked for what seemed like hours. Olga asked thoughtful questions about my relationship with Tatiana, not attacking or defending, but seeking to understand. I answered openly and honestly, feeling her sympathy rather than judgment of the situation. As we got up to leave, soaked through from the cool night air, I felt strangely hopeful. Olga took my hand, intertwining her fingers with mine, and we walked slowly toward the house. Final decisions had not yet been made, but the fragile trust between us was being rekindled. Over the next few days, Olga initiated several long heart-to-heart -heart conversations about the history of our relationship, our shared and separate dreams, and our sexual needs. Sometimes we laughed, sometimes we cried, sometimes we made love. It was like falling in love all over again. I ended my relationship with Tatiana as gently as I could. She was devastated, refusing to return my calls or see me for the first few weeks. But eventually she came to the office and we were able to talk privately. I apologized for misleading her and hurting her. She apologized for knowingly engaging in an affair with her daughter's husband. The road has not always been smooth, but Olga and I continue to cherish our rediscovered intimacy. We make time for weekly dates, and when we can, get away for short weekends, leaving work and technology behind. Next month, on our 15th anniversary of dating, We'll renew our vows in a small sunset ceremony in the same park where I confessed my infidelity. Tatiana, who has become close to Olga again, will attend the celebration. We look forward to being all together and forgetting forever the problems of the past.